Roughing It by Mark Twain, Chapter 26 By and by, I was smitten with the silver fever. Prospecting parties were leaving for the mountains every day and discovering and taking possession of rich silver bearing loads and ledges of quartz. Plainly, this was the road to fortune. The great Gould and Curry mine was held at three or four hundred dollars a foot when we arrived, but in two months it had sprung up to eight hundred. The Ofer had been worth only a mere trifle a year gone by, and now it was selling at nearly four thousand dollars a foot. Not a mine could be named that had not experienced an astonishing advance in value within a short time. Everybody was talking about these marvels. Go where you would, you heard nothing else from morning till far into the night. Tom so-and-so had sold out of the Amanda Smith for $40,000. Had an ascent when he took up the ledge six months ago. John Jones had sold half his interest in the bald eagle and Marianne for $65,000, gold coin, and gone to the States for his family. The widow Brewster had struck it rich in the golden fleece and sold ten feet for $18,000. Hadn't money enough to buy a crepe bonnet when Sing Sing Tommy killed her husband at Baldy Johnson's Wake last spring. The last chance had found a clay casing and knew they were right on the ledge. Consequence? Feet that went begging yesterday were worth a brick house apiece today, and seedy owners who could not get trusted for a drink at any bar in the country yesterday were roaring drunk on champagne today, and had hosts of warm personal friends in the town where they had forgotten how to bow or shake hands from long-continued want of practice. Johnny Morgan, a common loafer, had gone to sleep in the gutter and waked up worth a hundred thousand dollars in consequence of the decision in the Lady Franklin and Rough and Ready lawsuit. And so on, day in and day out, the talk pelted our ears and the excitement waxed hotter and hotter around us. I would have been more or less than human if I had not gone mad like the rest. Cartloads of solid silver bricks as large as pigs of lead were arriving from the mills every day, and such sights as that gave substance to the wild talk about me. I succumbed and grew as frenzied as the craziest. Every few days news would come of the discovery of a brand new mining region. Immediately the papers would teem with accounts of its richness, and away the surplus population would scamper to take possession. By the time I was fairly inoculated with the disease, Esmeralda had just had a run, and Humboldt was beginning to shriek for attention. Humboldt! Humboldt! was the new cry, and straightway Humboldt, the newest of the new, the richest of the rich, the most marvelous of the marvelous discoveries in Silverland, was occupying two columns of the public prints to Esmeralda's one. I was just on the point of starting to Esmeralda, but turned with the tide and got ready for Humboldt. That the reader may see what moved me, and what would as surely have moved him had he been there, I insert here one of the newspaper letters of the day. It and several other letters from the same calm hand were the main means of converting me. I shall not garble the extract, but put it in just as it appeared in the daily territorial enterprise. But what about our minds? I shall be candid with you. I shall express an honest opinion based upon a thorough examination. Humboldt County is the richest mineral region upon God's footstool. Each mountain range is gorged with the precious ores. 
Humboldt is the true Golconda. The other day, an assay of mere croppings yielded exceeding $4,000 to the ton. A week or two ago, an assay of just such surface developments made returns of $7,000 to the ton. Our mountains are full of rambling prospectors. Each day and almost every hour reveals new and more startling evidences of the profuse and intensified wealth of our favorite county. The metal is not silver alone. There are distinct ledges of auriferous ore. A late discovery plainly evinces cinnabar. The coarser metals are in gross abundance. Lately, evidences of bituminous coal have been detected. My theory has ever been that coal is a ligneous formation. I told Colonel Whitman in times past that the neighborhood of Dayton, Nevada, betrayed no present or previous manifestations of a ligneous foundation, and that hence I had no confidence in his lauded coal mines. I repeated the same doctrine to the exultant cool discoverers of hum coal discoverers of Humboldt. I talked with my friend Captain Birch on the subject. My Pyrrhonism vanished upon his statement that in the very region referred to he had seen petrified trees of the length of two hundred feet. Then is the fact established that huge forests once cast their grim shadows over this remote section. I am firm in the coal faith. Have no fears of the mineral resources of Humboldt County. They are immense. Incalculable. Let me state one or two things which will help the reader to better comprehend certain items in the above. At this time, our near neighbor Gold Hill was the most successful silver mining locality in Nevada. It was from there that more than half the daily shipments of silver bricks came. Very rich and scarce, Gold Hill ore yielded from $100 to $400 to the ton, but the usual yield was only $20 to $40 per ton. That is to say, each hundred pounds of ore yielded from $1 to $2. But the reader will perceive by the above extract that in Humboldt, from one-fourth to nearly half the mass was silver. That is to say, every 100 pounds of the ore had from $200 up to about 350 in it. Some days later, the same correspondent wrote, I have spoken of the vast and almost fabulous wealth of this region. It is incredible. The intestines of our mountains are gorged with precious ore to plethora. I have said that nature has so shaped our mountains as to furnish most excellent facilities for the working of our mines. I have also told you that the country about here is pregnant with the finest mill sites in the world. But what is the mining history of Humboldt? The Shiva mine is in the hands of energetic San Francisco capitalists. It would seem that the ore is combined with metals that render it difficult of reduction with our imperfect mountain machinery. The proprietors have combined the capital and labor hinted at in my exordium. They are toiling and probing. Their tunnel has reached the length of 100 feet. From primal assays alone, coupled with the development of the mine and public confidence in the continuance of effort, the stock had reared itself to $800 market value. I do not know that one ton of the ore has been converted into current metal. I do know that there are many loads in this section that surpass the Sheba in primal assay value. Listen a moment to the calculations of the Sheba operators. They purposed transporting the ore concentrated to Europe. The conveyance from Star City, its locality, to Virginia City will cost $70 per ton. From Virginia to San Francisco, $40 per ton. From thence to Liverpool, its destination, $10 per ton. 
Their idea is that its conglomerate metals will reimburse them their cost of original extraction, the price of transportation, and the expense of reduction, and that then a ton of the raw ore will net them $1,200. The estimate may be extravagant, Cut it in twain, and the product is enormous for transcending, far transcending any previous developments of our racy territory. A very common calculation is that many of our mines will yield $500 to the ton. Such fecundity throws the Gould and Curry, the Ophir, and the Mexican of your neighborhood in the darkest shadow. I have given you the estimate of the value of a single developed mine. Its richness is indexed by its market valuation. The people of Humboldt County are feet crazy. As I write, our towns are near deserted. They look as languid as a consumptive girl. What has become of our sinewy and athletic fellow citizens? They are coursing through ravines and over mountain tops. Their tracks are visible in every direction. Occasionally, a horseman will dash among us. His steed betrays hard usage. He alights before his adobe dwelling, hastily exchanges courtesies with his townsmen, hurries to an assay office, and from thence to the district recorders. In the morning, having renewed his provisional supplies, he is off again on his wild and unbeaten route, while the fellow numbers already his feet by the thousands. He is the horse leech. He has the craven stomach of the shark or anaconda. He would conquer metallic worlds. This was enough. The instant we had finished reading the above article, four of us decided to go to Humboldt. We commenced getting ready at once, and we also commenced upbraiding ourselves for not deciding sooner, for we were in terror lest all the rich mines would be found and secured before we got there, and we might have to put up with ledges that would not yield more than two or three hundred dollars a ton, maybe. An hour before, I would have felt opulent if I had owned ten feet in a gold hill mine whose ore produced twenty-five dollars to the ton. Now, I was already annoyed at the prospect of having to put up with mines, the poorest of which would be a marvel in gold hill.'